Hi everyone, this is Kelly Klein with the Tennessee Justice Center. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today and I'm going to start by um, introducing the other presenters that we have. Um, so the first person that we have joining us is Kira Hood. She is the WIC Mobile Program Coordinator and Clinical Care Liaison for Davidson County. Um, she's a registered dietitian, certified lactation counselor, and has her master's in public health. Kira has also been with the Davidson County WIC program for five years and has focused on clinic outreach and health equity. She's fluent in Spanish and seizes any opportunity to engage with Nashville's diverse immigrant and refugee populations. The next person we have joining us is Sarah Griswold. She is the nutrition program manager for the um, WIC clinic at the Knox County Health Department in Knoxville, Tennessee. She holds an undergraduate degree in dietetics from the University of Dayton and master's degrees in nutrition and public health from the University of Ten Tennessee at Knoxville. She's responsible for supervising nutrition educators and dietitians as they counsel with participants and ensuring participants' needs are met in compliance with various local, state, and federal regulations. Um, and then lastly, I'll be presenting a little bit at the end about um, WIC and Child Nutrition Advocacy. And I recently joined the Tennessee Justice Center as the WIC and Child Nutrition Advocate. Um, but for now, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kira just after we go through the agenda here. Um, so first, Kira is going to talk about kind of the basics of WIC, so who's eligible for the program, what kind of benefits you get, what the health outcomes are of the WIC program. Um, and then Sarah is going to take over and talk about um, barriers and solutions and specifically participant retention and the creative solutions she's come up with in Knox County. Um, and then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about um, just reiterate why WIC is important and why TJC is involved in it, and specifically what we're doing to help support WIC. And then lastly, of course, how you guys can get involved in supporting the WIC program um, here in Tennessee and nationally. So Kira, do you want to go ahead and um, take it from here? Absolutely. So like Kelly said, my name is Kira Hood, and I'm also very excited to be talking with you guys today. Um, I will be covering some of the basics and then also some innovations that Davidson County WIC has, um, has started. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so WIC was started in 1972 as an amendment to the Child Nutrition Act of 1966. And this was in response to growing concern in this country over malnutrition among poverty-stricken mothers and children. Many families were providing cow's milk instead of infant formula to their babies because they couldn't afford it. And we know that this is nutritionally inadequate for infants and can cause a slew of health problems. There were also, physicians were seeing pregnant moms in their clinics and observing them to have severe deficiencies related to food insecurity that were obviously affecting the health outcomes of not only them, but their babies. So by 1975, the program was being implemented in 45 states, and it was established as a permanent national health and nutrition program funded by the USDA. Today, WIC is in all 50 states and is typically administered through health departments. Next slide. So just to give you some basic background, if you're not very familiar with the WIC program, in, in order for eligible families to receive WIC benefits, they are required to come see, check in with nutrition educators every three months in the WIC clinic. Every six months, children are weighed and measured and we take hemoglobin yearly just to follow their growth measurements and keep them updated in our growth charts. This also helps guide nutrition counseling uh, for every family that's specifically individualized to that child's needs. So WIC dietitians and nutrition educators provide nutrition counseling and lactation support to families, as well as important referrals to applicable outside agencies. And that can be anywhere from dentists to pediatricians to social support agencies, um, really anything that they might need or have a question about. So once participants set their goals with nutritionists, they get all their questions answered, they then receive food benefits on an EBT card that they're allowed to utilize for the next three months. So you can see that WIC is really a multi-pronged program. We provide not only the food benefits, but also nutrition, education, lactation support, and referrals. So next slide. 
just to give you an idea of what these food benefits look like, I've included this chart here. Um, food packages are actually designed to fit the nutritional needs of different participants. So the food package that a prenatal woman versus postpartum versus breastfeeding or an infant or a young child get would all vary somewhat from each other in the quantity of foods as well as the type of foods they receive. The idea is that foods are meant to be developmentally appropriate for children in different stages and support nutritious and wholesome diets based on evidence-based nutrition practices. So one thing that we're always trying to reinforce is that many people see WIC as only an infant formula provision program. And we really want to make them understand that we are so much more than that. We provide much more than that. And really, we support and advocate for breastfeeding as the ideal form of nutrition for infants, um, but obviously believe that fed is best and we um, can provide formula when that's needed. So we just strive to support families in all of their goals and the beauty of this WIC program is that the benefits that families receive actually reinforce the messaging that they get from WIC nutritionists. Okay, next slide. So you may be wondering who's eligible for the program, and you would be happy to find out that WIC is an extremely inclusive program. Um, we accept families with incomes up to 185% of the federal poverty line. So currently, WIC serves 53% of infants born in the U.S. And then families who receive SNAP, TANF, or Medicaid are automatically eligible to receive WIC benefits uh, as long as they belong to one of our groups that are eligible. So that would be pregnant women, postpartum women up to one year if they're breastfeeding, and children up until their fifth birthday. Lastly, Technically, participants have to have some type of nutritional risk to qualify for the WIC program, but this could be anything even as um, seemingly detailed as they could be failing to meet the recommended number of fruit and vegetable servings daily. So we, WIC nutritionists, can always find a nutritional risk code for families, so this should never exclude someone from joining the program or inquiring uh, about the program. Next slide. So because WIC has been around for so long, almost 50 years now, we've been able to study the effects and outcomes of the program over a long period of time. Uh, it's been found that WIC is the nation's most successful and cost-effective public health nutrition program, and that it's demonstrated a variety of positive outcomes for its participants, from reduced risk of premature and low birth weight babies, um, for pregnant moms who participated, to improved diet quality and access to health care for children, uh, as they enter kindergarten. So I won't read this whole list to you, but you can see that WIC participants stand to benefit significantly in their quality of life and health outcomes um, by participating in the program. And the sooner that they get on the program, for example, as a pregnant woman, as soon as she has her positive pregnancy test, um, the better these outcomes are. And next slide. So this picture here on the right is actually my team. Um, I'm with the WIC mobile program of Davidson County. So this is us standing in front of our one of our WIC mobile vans. So WIC mobile was actually started six years ago in Davidson County, and we recognized that there were severe transportation barriers to our brick and mortar clinics that were more centralized to the city. So we knew that in order to capture our participants that were on the outlying edges of the county, we needed to come and meet them where they were. So we started by partnering with community agencies that allowed us to use their physical spaces to host two, three hour um, mobile clinics. So for example, we partner with libraries, food banks, community centers, subsidized housing complexes, immigrant and refugee agencies, um, really anyone that's in the right spot uh, that we are trying to target geographically um, that supports our mission. So we go out every day and hold a mobile clinic, and we've seen that our participants are extremely grateful um, to be able to come, that we're coming so much closer to their homes. We hear all the time that if it weren't for us, they would not be able to get WIC. And that's really our goal is to reach those participants that otherwise would not be reached by the clinics. So that's been a really cool opportunity. Obviously includes a lot of 
partnerships that we intend to be mutually beneficial for them and for us. Um, the WIC in the Hospital program is another kind of outreach program that we do here in Davidson County that provides WIC services bedside to moms in four large area hospitals. So they obviously do a lot of lactation support and um, also are able to do the complete certification visit for a new mom and baby right at the bedside in the hospital. So this allows us to capture some moms who may not have even heard of us before, um, but also even our moms that were on the program now don't have to take a newborn baby to a WIC clinic. They're able to, to be seen and get their benefits started right there in the hospital. Um, we have started with some telewick, um, which is just doing nutrition counseling appointments over the phone. This is even more convenient, I think, than the mobile site as families don't have to go anywhere. They just have to answer their phone and um, just take part in a brief nutrition counseling check-in. And then we are able to load benefits on their card from our office. And this also takes some of the burden away from our busy mobile sites when we're able to talk ahead of time with families that are low risk that would fit um, the profile of someone who could do telewick. And then lastly, we have a WIC online option as well where participants can do a learning module online and then receive benefits on their card after they complete that education se educational session. So there's a lot of innovations going on in the WIC program. Davidson County really strives to be as a, an urban center um, kind of on the forefront of these innovations. And um, I'm excited to hear what the rest of the presenters have to say today. And I'd be happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. On the next slide, you'll find my, yeah, my contact information. If you are ever wanting to refer someone to WIC, but you wouldn't know what clinic or maybe even what county they live in, this is the Tennessee WIC hotline. So this is a good number they can have to call and they can ask any WIC questions they may have and be referred to the center closer, closest to them. And then my information is below. Feel free to email or call me um, with any questions or any collaborative opportunities you may see with your organization in mind. So that's all I've got. Thank you so much, Kira. We really appreciate your guidance on um, WIC 101, so the basics of WIC. Um, and now we're gonna pass it off to Sarah Griswold with the Knox County Health Department. And she's going to talk a little bit about what her team does, um, particularly as it relates to participant retention. Sarah, do you want to go ahead and start up? Yes, thank you. Go ahead to my next slide, please. So um, I'm so pleased to be here. I am the nutrition manager for Knox County. And um, I'm going to actually start repeating a tiny bit of what Kira said. She mentioned transportation is one of the reasons they really do focus on the mobile WIC, and so we know that our um, low to low moderate, because 185% of federal poverty levels is actually like 47,000 or so for a family of four annually. That's on a future slide, but our, oh, I'll get ahead of myself, I'm sorry. So transportation issues are, are a problem in some of our um, participants because the car that they have goes with the employed caregiver and the other caregiver stays home with the children without a car. Or the car that they have is unreliable, or the car that they have requires gas that is very expensive, or the car that they have belongs to a family member or a friend and they have to beg for rides, or they have to figure out the bus schedule. And if the bus in Knox County actually comes within a mile of their house, it does come within a block of our health department. But figuring out all the different transportation issues just to get here is a barrier for some of our families. The time commitments, just to say that our appointments do take time. Um, so a lot of our families may complain that it takes too long. Our appointments have become more efficient, I believe, with our new um, computer system, but with technology, eh, that's, that's hit or miss sometimes. Sometimes that's our technology slowing us down. So our families do have to consider how long an appointment takes. It feels a lot longer if you've got a tired or hungry toddler who's screaming at you. So it takes so much longer when your babies are upset and they have to be here with you. Or if you're missing work, it doesn't matter if it's 10 minutes. If it took you 10, 10 minutes to get here, 
the visit's going to take time, and then you got to get back. That's work that you're missing. And in this um, in this set of people in our population, that's not necessarily paid sick leave or paid time off from work. They might be missing pay to actually come to their WIC appointments. So there's time commitments to consider. And then the customer service. In WIC, we work so hard to make sure that our customers are a priority, and we work very hard on each other through trainings annually and, and really, you know, feeding ourselves good, heartfelt. And we work, and we know we still mess up, and we get complaints rarely. But we, we talk about, you know, what does it mean to really provide the best customer service that we can. But grocery stores are the other end of the coin. We send people out of here with um, benefits to go spend in a grocery store. And depending upon where they're shopping and what they're dealing with, they don't necessarily get the best customer service all the time there. So depending upon how their experience goes, some people will say Wix not worth it. So we try very hard to do what we can. So next slide, please. So to address kind of all three of these transportation, time, and customer service issues, we do offer what we call FastPass. Kira said accurately, it's the online nutrition education where they can create an account and complete a nutrition education lesson online. We then see that they've completed that lesson in clinic and we follow up and make sure their benefits are issued and schedule their next appointment. No bother, no worries, all done. Never had to set foot in clinic. Um, we also offer phone counseling for our follow-up visits, um, the telewick that Kira mentioned. And then Knox County is very, very much, we're getting so close, we're salivating for this mobile WIC opportunity. Um, Davidson dove in before we were electronic and they charted, y'all carried charts, y'all carried printers, and um, we kind of looked on as y'all are the heroes. So now that we are electronic, really all we need is our computers, a um, little bit of equipment to do measures, and we are ready. We are really looking at Head Start as a potential first partner, um, but then sky's the limit, so we'll see what makes sense for us and our local population as far as getting out of the clinic and actually offering WIC services elsewhere. Um, next slide. So shopping has been a concern nationwide. They have noticed that WIC shopping is hard. Um, people get extremely frustrated when what they choose off the shelf they believe to be a WIC product, and when they get up to the cash register, they realize WIC's not going to pay for this. It's embarrassing, it's frustrating, and if it happens more than once, a lot of families are ready to give in, and just WIC's not worth it. So to address shopping concerns in Knox County, we developed what we call WIC Lady SOS, or superstars of shopping, and it went through some, some growing pains until we finally said we need a cell phone. And so we did. We bought a cell phone, and we give all of our clients that cell phone number, and we say, look, you can text us. You can send us pictures of your receipt. You can send us pictures of the product. If it's got a UPC code, we can look it up and make sure, and that way we can verify, yes, this is not only a WIC product, but it's also a product that you are eligible to receive. Um, just for fun, I can say tuna is a product that the store, the store shelf might say WIC underneath the tuna. Tuna is for breastfeeding mothers. So it is a WIC food, but not all of our WIC clients get it. In the dairy aisle, almost all of the milks are all marked WIC, but it's very specific who gets which milk. So you can't always rely on say, well, that's a WIC food on the shelf, and then expect it to actually be taken off your benefits when you get um, up to pay for it. So we, we take phone calls, um, text messages, we consult pictures of, of receipts, and we work with our mamas to help them understand that this is not a WIC benefit of yours, but something very similar to it would be. Or we follow up at the stores and say, we need to figure out why this didn't come off their receipt, and we take that information um, through our central office to try to figure out what's going on if a proper product wasn't paid for. Um, so we get a lot of really great information through our SOS phone line. Um, we do promote the use of the online portal that comes with our benefits. So the EBT card, we've been doing that now for a year. Um, and the banking system that does the EBT 
has a consumer customer portal so they can actually log in and see their benefits. It's one of the biggest questions we get is how do I know how much I have left? So we promote the use of that online portal. That would be available across the state. Also statewide next year, and we're waiting with bated breath, um, the researchers at Vanderbilt are developing an app that um, our clients will be able to download, and that will link to their benefits. So it will show them their benefits, what they have left. It will have their piloting with um, recipes and all kinds of amazing functionality within this app. So we're very, very excited that that's coming statewide soon enough. And then in Knox County, we are working with um, University of Tennessee at Knoxville on a couple different studies. One, they're really wanting to see what Tennesseans' experience has been switching from paper vouchers over to an electronic card and how, how has that, what has their reaction been and how have they enjoyed it, what are the hiccups or hangups. And then the second study they're really working on that's just now rolling out is online purchasing. So with the advent of each of our grocery stores offering an online, um, shopping online and then going to the store to pick it up, they've partnered with Food City to actually do that. Um, and there's a lot involved in that. It's not, you can't swipe your WIC card in the machine that comes out to your car side the way you can swipe a bank card um, car side. So our WIC mamas will go in to Food City to complete their transactions, but they will have ordered their fruits and veggies and all their foods online, and it will already be picked out and waiting for them when they pull up. So in theory, this will be a tremendous benefit to mamas with little ones that they won't have to shop and deal with their little ones pulling stuff off the shelves and all that kind of thing. Um, next slide. So I was asked to specifically, what can our partners do to help us? And honestly, we need your referrals. We would love to see as many people qualify. And so please talk to categorically eligible folks and ask what they know about the WIC program. And the categorically eligible, eligible is what Kira said. It's pregnant women postpartum up to six months, 12 months if they're breastfeeding. It's the babies, the toddlers, and little ones up to age five. So anybody categorically eligible, ask what they know about the WIC program. I've heard that it can be really sensitive if people assume, well, that means you think I'm poor. And that's not at all what this should be. It should be a broad blanket, what do you know about the WIC, WIC program? Um, because adjunctive eligibility, if you're on TenCare or SNAP, we accept that eligibility automatically. But if you don't receive those programs, you might actually still be eligible. 185% um, of the federal poverty level is actually a pretty decent wage in Tennessee. It goes a lot farther than a lot of people realize, and 47000 annually for a family of four is a decent salary if dad is working and mom stays home with her kiddos because daycare is too expensive. 47000 is not really poverty wages, it's 185%. So um, also people don't necessarily realize how rich the benefits truly are. It can be 60 to $75 each month for each child who's eligible. Um, obviously, if they're on infant formula, the benefits are, are worth more than, um, financially, formula is a little more than that. Um, but if mom is breastfeeding, there's a lot of invaluable support and she gets a lot more food than what we give our children. So the benefits really are worth it. Next slide. So if your client's pushing back like, well, I don't know, I had WIC, but these are just kind of the, some of the thoughts that I wanted to share. Um, our electronic health records and our EBT cards make shopping a lot easier, more discreet. We now have additional opportunities like the phone and the online education, meaning they don't have to be in clinic every three months. Our referral measures from our community health care providers are gladly accepted. And so if you send us measures or if clients have measures within the last 60 days, they get to skip waiting on the lab. We don't have to do those measures if they're bringing us measures their doctor took within the last two months. And then, honestly, if you all let us know what your clients are telling you or what you're hearing or what our reputation is, if our clients aren't sharing with us other than by just not showing up for appointments, then we don't know what we need to fix. So if y'all can give us your feedback or help us serve our clients better by addressing any misconceptions or any 
anything that we can do to make participation easier and more worth it for our families. We would love to be definitely a part of the solution. Next slide. I think that's my last one. So I'm happy to take questions um, now or towards the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. We really appreciate you contributing um, that perspective about participant retention. Um, and I think we're going to wait until to take questions until the end, and then just in case some of the questions are answered along the way. Um, but we do have time reserved at the end to answer the questions that you all may have. Um, so before I go on to how TJC is involved with WIC, I just kind of want to reiterate just how important it is and how many good positive outcomes there are. Um, so there definitely are real barriers that participants face, but there also are very real benefits that um, WIC provides to the community. So this is that slide that Kira um, showed earlier about the health outcomes, but I also added one at the end um, that I thought was especially interesting about WIC increasing community access to healthy foods. Um, one of the cool things that WIC does is that um, approved vendors that usually wouldn't stock healthy foods will start stocking healthy foods in order to um, be able to serve WIC participants. So places like corner stores or grocery stores that didn't have fruits and vegetables before will start stocking fruits and vegetables so that WIC participants can shop there. And as a result, people who are not on WIC, either other people in the family or just other people in the community can now access those healthy foods. Um, so WIC isn't just beneficial for the immediate participants, but it also is very beneficial for the entire community. Um, and those WIC funds go directly to the local vendors, so all of that money that's being provided for the food benefits is going back directly into the local um, economy and local vendors. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate all of the positive things that are happening and the great work that um, Kira and Sarah, for example, are doing. Um, and kind of with that in mind and all of the positive things that WIC helps with, also thinking about how in Tennessee the participation rate is only 43%. Um, so basically what that means is that of all of the people who are eligible to participate in WIC, only 43% of them are actually engaging with the WIC program and actively receiving benefits. So just to give you some context, the national average participation rate is 55%. And that puts Tennessee as the third lowest participation rate among all U.S. states and territories. Um, I believe it's Wyoming and Montana who are below Tennessee. Um, and so just, um, yeah, so Tennessee has the third lowest participation rate. And when you're considering or asking why that participation rate is so low, um, part of it is what Sarah talked about earlier, the transportation issues, the time commitments, the customer service. So losing people um, who are maybe engaging with WIC, but because they don't have transportation or it requires too much time, they kind of fall off their benefits or miss appointments, things like that, and it's harder to kind of get back on those benefits afterwards. But I also wanted to add a couple other reasons why this participation rate might be low. People might just not know that WIC exists. Um, there might be misunderstandings about WIC eligibility and benefits. So one example is like foster parents or single dads might not think that their child is eligible to, to receive WIC because they think, oh, I'm not a pregnant or postpartum woman with a child, where in reality, if they meet the income, um, residential, and nutrition risk thresholds, if they have a child that's under five, then that child can re still receive WIC benefits. Same goes for grandparents who have custody or foster parents who have custody. So there's a lot of misconceptions about who's eligible for WIC and um, what you receive. There's also, there can be language barriers at WIC clinics and even in WIC outreach. So organizations that are reaching out um, to get people to know about WIC might not be providing all of the outreach materials in a way that is best serving the population they're targeting. And this is Signe again. I, I wanted to add one one thing here to go along with the language barriers. Uh, the recent public charge uh, rule that was released also has had some contribute some contribution to uh, low participation rates across the country. Uh, there have been a lot of um, a lot of anecdotal um, and uh, examples of people 
returning their benefits for fear that they would lose citizenship or it would harm their their standing um, in in the United States. So that's another factor that folks are are expressing as a reason for low participation, um, not only in Tennessee but across the country. Uh, so we're also concerned about that. So this brings us to how the Tennessee Justice Center is involved with WIC. Um, basically, we know that a lot of these barriers do exist, but we're not entirely sure which ones are the main barriers and if they differ between different areas. So, for example, rural and urban populations, if there's different barriers there. Um, and we also don't know which ones are specific to Tennessee. So, for example, we have um, anecdotal evidence about transportation issues, and there have been other states who have looked into this more, but we're kind of looking more for a Tennessee-specific exploration of what, the, what WIC is like for Tennesseans who need to access it. Um, another thing that we're doing is we are trying to highlight the good work that's already being done. Um, so again, there are barriers, but there's also really good work already being done to address them. So for example, the mobile clinic that Kira manages um, and the texting line that Sarah's team came up with are both really great examples of how you can solve um, some of the barriers that the participants are facing. And we kind of want to just be able to serve it as um, kind of a megaphone, so to speak, <laughs> for the people who are already solving these in really creative ways. Um, so we're looking to kind of share those best practices with others. And then the last thing, um, is TJC addressing the participation rate through education and outreach. So just kind of telling partners um, like y'all who are here on the call about what WIC is and making sure that there's an awareness that this program exists and that it's very beneficial for communities. So this webinar is an example of us doing that. We're also looking to really engage partners in terms of integrating this knowledge into kind of the practice of um, the y'all's workplaces. So we really want this to be more than just kind of a, a one-off webinar. We want it to really um, be relevant to the work y'all are doing and we want y'all to be able to see how WIC can be relevant to the participants, especially if they are mutual participants. Um, and then the last part is we can help increase the participation rate by changing the program itself as opposed to kind of advocating for how the program currently is functioning. So we can, um, and Sydney's going to talk a little bit about this in a second, but um, the WIC program is up for reauthorization soon, and so one of the things that we're going to be working on is really looking at the legislation and how it's enacted on a federal and state level and trying to figure out how we can make changes there so that it'll kind of trickle down in the implementation later on. Um, so now we're going to get to how you guys can support WIC in your work. So just like I said, and like Sarah mentioned before, um, one of the best things you can do is refer people to WIC, refer them to their local WIC clinic. Um, and the people there are very, very good at what they do. So they, um, you know, they know all of the details of the eligibility and the benefits. So if you feel like um, it's a lot of stuff to remember, then you can always refer people to the WIC clinic um, and they can help the potential participant out. Um, you can also spread the word to other community partners that you think might work with a similar population. You can post the information on your bulletin boards and e-newsletters. If you subscribe to our newsletters, we'll send out updates around the WIC program in addition to SNAP benefits and child nutrition. Um, and if you find anything in there that you think is especially worth sharing to partners, you can go ahead and forward our newsletter, tell them to sign up. You can also just share the details of the content of the newsletter with partners. Um, and I think that'll go a long way to just increasing the awareness of WIC as a program. And then on the, actually before we go into the second book, one of the things um, as far as spreading the word, uh, one tweak that we made to our work, we have client caseworkers who, who work with uh, pregnant women on uh, accessing uh, health care and we have incorporated some questions about WIC and I've also uh, started sending out uh, final case closing along with their case closing letters information about how to access WIC if we know uh, we're working with a, a pregnant mom uh, or a mother who 
uh, has young children that would qualify for WIC. Um, and then moving into number two uh, around supporting positive state and federal legislation, part of the work we do here at TJC is to monitor legislation. And before um, before going into the CNR piece on child nutrition reauthorization, there was a bill on 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 the state side that was introduced that actually was harmful to WIC. And so we we spoke out and made made sure that others. Um, were aware of the bill, uh, and uh, luckily the bill was not uh, passed through. Um, but this bill again kind of speaks to the public charge piece, in that it was asking for verification of citizenship um, in order to receive WIC, and and we push back against that and, and don't believe that that's something that should um, should be a part of our legislation here in Tennessee. And then on the federal side, every five years, child nutrition reauthorization takes place when Congress has a chance to look at the different child nutrition programs, and this includes school lunch, school breakfast, the summer meal program, and also WIC. Uh, and WIC is one of those programs uh, that has some interesting legislation uh, already proposed around a CNR. Uh, recently, uh, recently, uh, Senator Casey and uh, Senator Susan Collins, uh, so both a Republican and a Democrat, have uh, proposed some bipartisan legislation uh, through the Wise Investment in Our Children Act, uh, which would help to make the WIC program stronger. And they're looking specifically at extending the child el eligibility through five, because right now uh, it's up to age five, uh, and once a child turns five, they're no longer eligible for WIC. So this would be through, through age five, so up to six. It also looks at eliminating burdensome paperwork requirements uh, and then also improving new mothers' access to nutrition supports by increasing the certification timeframe for both breastfeeding and non-breastfeeding women to two years postpartum. So all of these changes would would be beneficial in reaching children when when they are young and nutrition is very important in supporting mothers. Uh, so that's uh, some legislation that we'll be sharing um, and in any way that we can share stories or, or highlight how things are working really well in Tennessee as, as it relates to WIC, we want to do that and elevate uh, the importance of this program, not only for the individual, because it's very important to the individual, but it also has an impact to the community and in the state as a whole. Uh, so we want to highlight the, the positive features of the program and and do what we can to push for, for positive uh, state and federal legislation. Um, and then the last thing I've already mentioned a million times, which is just that um, if you just want to stay in the loop on updates on WIC, SNAP, and child nutrition, you can subscribe to our newsletter. And then all of those updates and um, condensed action steps will all be in a single email once a month um, so that you don't have to be subscribed to a million other different newsletters about this topic. Oops. Um, so here, and I'm going to email this PowerPoint out to everybody afterwards too as a follow-up, um, so don't worry about writing all these resources down, but I thought that I would include some resources just in case you guys are curious about um, exploring WIC more. Um, we have the ones that have already been mentioned as well as links to the local WIC clinics. And then I've also included a link to the Tennessee Justice um, webpage that covers our nutrition team and our hunger solutions work. Um, and then another plug for the newsletter. Um, so now I think we're going to open it up to see if anyone has any questions. Um, I know we have one already that um, Kira, Sarah, you might have an answer to this one. Um, so we have a question about someone who has a lot of older adult clients raising grandchildren, um, and if these grandparents would have trouble enrolling their grandkids who live with them. Um, so I know that grandparents who do have custody of their grandchildren can definitely enroll their children in SNAP um, if they have custody. If they don't have custody and they're just caregivers, they can still take their take their grandkids to appointments if they're designated as a proxy. Um, 
I don't know the answer, however, Kira, Sarah, if you know this, feel free to chime in, if how they would count, if it's the same as it is in SNAP, counting toward household income. Do either of y'all know? Yes, we see grandparents all the time. So it is the child who is eligible. Um, frequently in that situation, it is eligible through 10 care. Um, if the child receives 10 care, then the child is eligible, and it doesn't. We don't assess household income at that point. Um, if the child is in a family that receives SNAP, if the family has SNAP benefits, then that SNAP letter is showing the family eligible, um, and the child part of that family. I, I'm not usually the one that looks at those letters, so I don't know exactly what they say. But yes, SNAP eligibility for the household, the child on 10 care, those are the easiest ways to show it. And that is with a grandparent who um, would have custody. We would need some sort of paperwork showing that the grandparent is able to make legal decisions for that child. Um, we do also recognize proxies. If mom is still the legal agent for that child because she's mom, then she can ask or she can sign a very simple form at certification saying, we have assessed that mom and the child are eligible for WIC. But she's going to say a simple note that says, um, her mother, give us the name, or you know, whoever it is that has some knowledge of the child's eating habits and, and everything, um, can attend WIC visits on her behalf and can receive um, the benefits on behalf of the child. So we accept proxies if mom or the legal care um, caregiver signs that note at certification. And if the parent, grandparents are the legal caregivers, then yes, the child can continue to participate in WIC. Awesome. Um, and Shelby, does that answer your question about um, grandparents? Do you have any other questions about alternative caregivers? Um, and then does anyone else have any questions? And we've unmuted the lines, folks. So if, if um, feel free to use the chat box if you'd like. But if you um, would rather just shout out your question, we we open up the lines. And it can be questions like about the work that we do or um, pertaining to your work specifically, like if you're curious, how would I tell my clients about this? Um, feel free to ask those questions too. And we might have a couple more questions coming in over chat. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is we did we are recording this and will make the recording available to folks. So, um, and as Kelly said, we'll send out the slides and, and the resources as well uh, following this call. Um, last call for questions. So my name is Sarah, and I'm the other nutrition advocate at TJC. And I just have some other questions about WIC specifically for the WIC mobile. Um, I didn't know if there were any limits to how far you guys could take the van within the county or outside the county, um, just what the range is for that. Yeah, great question. So we only take the van within the county, um, but we can go anywhere within Davidson County. And we kind of chose our locations based on need. Um, and we know that if you look at our poverty maps in Davidson County, the Southeast region is really um, densely low poverty or high poverty. So uh, we, you'll see if you ever look at our WIC mobile maps, that's where a lot of our sites are. But we also strive to go to the really outlying areas like Old Hickory or Hermitage or Antioch. Um, so we can go anywhere within the county. Perfect, thank you. And my other mm -hmm. question was, um, how easy is it to get that proxy form? Is that online? Could they um, print it off and bring it in themselves? or would they need to go into the clinic? Just, I've, I had somebody ask me that same question a couple days ago and I would love to have an answer to send them. The proxy works when the legal guardian agent, who, mother typically, or the legal caregiver is available for the certification visit because 
that's who we actually need to sign rights and responsibilities and to take care of the financial information at the front end. So when they are in clinic for the certification visit, that is when we make the proxy form available. And so it would, we would need to see the caregiver, the legal caregiver, once a year. If they, have, if they assign proxy, the proxy can attend the rest of the visits. Um, or we can reach out by phone. So it's, it's still we need to verify eligibility and do the full certification assessment. Um, that is annual, and that, that would be the legal caregiver to do that. Um, and then it looks like we have another question about if the automatic eligibility is only for TennCare and Medicaid or if it works for cover kids too. Um, I'm actually not sure about the answer for that one. Sarah, Kira, do you know? Off the top of my head, I need to defer to Kira. Yeah, so I think that cover kids and correct me if I'm wrong, but cover kids can like temporarily cover a mom during pregnancy, and I believe we cannot use that as income um, because it is just a temporary coverage. Um, I know we, so my, I know I we can't use it for women. Yeah. Because cover kids will cover a mom when she's pregnant. Exactly. And we cannot use it for women. I know women. we can't use it for women. Yeah. I'm not, I tend to think that might be the same for children who are on cover yeah. kids, but I, I, I do not wish to be quoted. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. But, yeah. Yes, that's that's and, where I'm leaning also. And we'll do a little research on our end too. And when we send out the the PowerPoint, we'll just confirm the final answer on that one. And then this will probably be our last call for questions. Does anyone have anything else to be curious about? All right, so if no one has any other questions, um, I'll hold on. Um, I'll just put our contact information here. So um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to give us a call or email us. Um, again, I'm going to send out the PowerPoint afterwards so you'll have this um, for reference. So if nobody has anything else, Sarah, Kira, do you guys have anything that you wanted to add? No? No, thanks. All right, well, thanks for everyone for joining us for today's call. And Kira and Sarah, thanks so much for sharing uh, your wisdom and experience. We appreciate it. No problem. It was great. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.